Hello everybody, I'm Sap Anderson from Autodesk in the 3ds Max rendering team and today I'm going to talk about OSL. OSL is the open shading language. It's an open source project run by Larry Gritz over at uh, Sony Pictures Imageworks and it's an open source shading language implementation that you can plug into basically any renderer and we decided to plug it into 3ds Max 2019. It shows up as basically three things. First of all, it's a brand new map called the OSL map, but there's also a whole new category of maps simply called OSL. And finally, there's some interesting little development tool thingies I'll be showing a little later. So, yeah, let's go. Anyone who's been using Max for any length of time is quite familiar with the good old general category of maps. There's a bunch of them in there, they've been with us from, for years, and every year there's like one or two added because it's quite a significant effort to write a new um, map for Max. And we got some stuff like the shape map or blended box map recently. This year we get two new in this category. We get the advanced wood, which is cool in itself. Uh, we'll get to that one later. And we also have the OSL map which allows us to use OSL in Max. However, I won't get to this one just quite yet. Instead, I will close up our general category and notice there's a brand new category here called OSL. This contains a bunch of shaders that we can use. I have this sample scene here of a teapot on a piece of box sitting somewhere in Paris. Um, environment map of Paris. I will uh, start my active shade with that and just randomly drop in an OSL shader like for instance this checkerboard map and we will see uh, that yes this works renders and is fully interactive with uh, the Arnold active shade so we can yeah, see it we can drop in another one like this Mandelbrot shader for instance which is uh, if you're into fractals, this might be interesting. We have one that does, um, for the steampunkers among you, I wrote us a uh, rivets shader, which uh, yeah adds a set of rivets uh, around the squares in UV space. And there's a whole bunch of features on that. I won't go into the details. Now, what I'm demonstrating here is Arnold. But don't, don't let this deceive you that this, for some reason, only works in Arnold. That's not the case. I can show you this rendering in good old Scanline Renderer. We will find that our rivet scene looks pretty similar in Scanline to what it does in the Arnold Active Shade. But of course the difference is that the Arnold one is interactive. Doing this means, of course, that the shaders work everywhere else in Max where shaders can be used like the displacement modifier or wherever. You can do, you know, render them, um, bake them to texture or do whatever you want with them. Here's a quick example of the rivets in a more real world action. We have a setup here which takes a UV channel, uh, puts it through a transform and into a UVW row offset, which is what gives these uh, offsets for each of the rows. Uh, so if I say, for instance, 3 here and 0.33 offset, we'll have uh, every 3, uh, like a 3 row offset. All this goes into the rivet shader itself which of course does all sorts of stuff with the rivets like you can define the probability of how many has fallen out so now we only have 40 percent of the rivets visible uh, there's wobbliness for each of the metal plates so we can make it look um, all kind of bent out of shape and of course there's the colors and all the obvious stuff um, the values from that then gets fed through all these outputs that the shader has. For instance, the plate index that goes into index-based randomizers like this one, which takes an input index and a random seed, which we can flip around, uh, and sets 
like a brightness value on each of the plates uh, by multiplying that with the color and tossing it into the material here. So this is the kind of way uh, a setup would look. And the interesting part of this is, of course, uh, the UV side of things, where we're feeding in UV coordinates. If you don't feed UV coordinates to a shader, there will be a default setup, which is here just uh, y like a single UV mapping across the object. Uh, and of course, this is coming from a UV channel. Uh, I have an option here where it comes from the object space. So now it's projected kind of from above in object space doesn't make much sense for this scene but uh, it just shows you that UVs can always be driven unlike how it works in the classical max shaders where UVs are just a built-in thing and you can only do what that does here you can do any math to UVs randomizations or all sorts of stuff to make really complex and cool things happen Another one that is out useful out of the books is this one, the uh, randomized bitmap. Let me turn on the renderer and see what that does. Basically, it can pick a bunch of image files, up to 10, although you can cascade them together to get more, and mix them with shifts in hue, saturation, value, whatever. So let's demonstrate it a little by turning down the number of bitmaps and turning down some of the changes. So let's reset our hue shifts and our saturation shifts um, like that. So now we don't have that. We can turn back to say use five of the bitmaps. We can change the random seed which can be done per object if one wants. Uh, we can turn down the probability. There's fewer of them. We can uh, play with the scale so we get smaller ones. I guess we need more probability for that etc etc the probability can be driven by a randomness function to clump it and we can do rotations and uh, basically everything it can make you know transparency and on and on and on and on and on lots of fun with that one so that's these shaders or maps i keep saying shaders because in OSL, they're technically shaders. Max calls them maps or materials, depending on what they are. But we have these, the Baker's Dozen, and something I should show you maybe here is all the different categories that also exist for mathematical, uh, you know, floating point operations, color operations, vector operations, getting data from the scene, like, you know, frame numbers, material IDs, objects ID, particle edge, switchers, logical compares, the all important UVW category, which synthesizes, transforms, and tweaks your UVs in all sorts of ways that you could never possibly do in, in normally in the old school Max shaders and drive anything anyhow. The sum of this in total. It's actually over 100 new maps. So rather than throwing in like one or two as we used to do, uh, we throw in 100. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And of course, since these work in the classical uh, rendering API, they work everywhere. They work in your displacement modifier. They work in your V-Ray or Corona or whatever runs the classical shading API or in the renderers, of course, that uh, support the OSL map directly the way Arnold is doing it. So admittedly, I'm a little bit of a nerd, but to me, these 100 plus new maps, it's not really the exciting bit. This, what I'm showing now, is the exciting bit to me. I'm loading in the OSL map itself, which is basically the blank slate for OSL. It doesn't do anything until you load some shader into it. And I have here some stuff I just downloaded off the internet. It's you can literally Google OSL shaders and find hundreds if not thousands all over the place. This is a thing that does some kind of wiggly lines it seems. Maybe great for cat hair on a couch or something like that. Or I can load in another one here. It's one called Stones, which uh, seems to be, it's very small, but seems to be some kind of randomized tiles of some sort. Could probably be useful. 
there's another one here I can load in um, seats over here uh, it's called leopard which makes like the dots on a leopard uh, like so also pretty small zoom in a bit and it has a secondary output called D which is I guess some kind of distance from the center of the leopard dot I don't know could probably be useful for something so loading in shaders you found anywhere on the internet most of them should work uh, as long as they work as textures as maps we do not yet support materials in this release stuff that returns closures will be in a future release but now comes maybe the even more interesting part let's make a simple example I loaded in this checker.osl which by the way is technically not checkers because it works with the uh, stacked cubes that's why it looks weird alternating we find that it behaves in a strange way we try to turn up the scale and notice our cubes get smaller we find that weird and wonder I wonder what this shader is doing well we just click this button and up pops the source code so here we see for instance the input position scale color one color two and the output color uh, we see some math happening here with the scale something something time scale whatever we realize it's working backwards so maybe what this code means to do is divide by scale let's try it we compile it and while it were rendering it's actually recompiling our shader and yes now we have something that behaves the way we want it scales up as we turn it turn up the parameter value we can even extend this shader with some I don't know some additional feature saying we add a parameter called bright and at the end we just multiply the color with bright now check what happens when I hit compile look up here bang we have a new parameter a new input called bright which you can turn and we can yeah we have just extended it but wait a minute you say zap what happens have we actually now modified checker.osl will this break other scenes that use checker.osl no it will not because you'll see here it says modified stored in scene this code our modified version actually lives literally in this actual map as basically a string with this code in it which means it lives completely in the scene so if I send this scene to a render farm in Hawaii or whatever it will render with this without me having to send anything with it it's all completely embedded of course for the particular case of changing the brightness I wouldn't really have had to go into the code I could kind of just as well take the color multiply and drop it on the wire and do a multiplication here of course that does exactly the same thing effectively both ways are equally valid and since OSL actually optimizes entire shade trees in its compilation step it's actually not technically any different one isn't more efficient than the other so there you have it some ways to you can literally edit shaders while the renderer is running and for the actual developers you can even use the OSL map itself as the blank slate because there is some sample code inside it which at least gives you a hint of the syntax of the shader so you don't do complete nonsense of course it, its syntax highlights and it has error reportings and things like that so it's pretty useful stuff so if we go back to the beginning you remember I said we would have an OSL map which we have we would have a whole category of shaders and we would have a development tool we would have an OSL map shaders development tool are you getting it okay these things are all one and the same actually there's actually no difference between this OSL map and things loaded from these categories except one thing
the things loaded from these from the categories down here come in in the linked mode that means they are working with files so it will actually load these files and we load it at runtime when you render it's using this file so there's a connection to the file and you can't edit you can look at it this is a viewer button now but you can't edit it however since these are all one and the same you can unlink it and now suddenly this is stored in the scene and you are allowed to edit it so I could do something to this shader I will just do something random doesn't matter additional parameter bang or if you change your mind and say no wait a minute I don't want that you can just link it again it will inform you that hey you would edited it I say no that's fine bang it undoes back to the original the source undoes back this goes back to read-only viewer you're linked again you're connected to the file and it will always now follow the file again and for the developers among us there's also a lot of options to customize the shader in such a way that it can, can contain metadata for things like uh, tooltips and you can control help texts links and even modify the little logo down here and the developers can also deploy their shaders to the plugins directory and have them automatically show up here in the category so these are some of the things you can do with the OSL in 3ds Max 2019. I hope you will enjoy it and this is Sap out for now. Bye bye.